to item 2.1, our closed sessions of the day, 2.1 and 2.2, conference with legal counsel, existing litigation, and conference with legal counsel, anticipated litigation. Madam City Clerk, can you please facilitate public comment on these items? Thank you, we are now taking public comment on item two, closed sessions. If you'd like to provide a comment, please make your way to the podium. You will have three minutes and a countdown timer will alert at the end of that period. As you approach the podium, please provide your name for public record if you choose to do so. Speaker, go ahead at the podium. Mr. Ells, are you gonna provide public comment on item two? Yes, uh, do forgive me. Um, these PFAS, uh, the DuPont products, just as bad or worse than glyphosate, and, and uh, they are various substitutions for refrigerants and things that really didn't work. There, there used to be a law that said you had to give studies of the chemicals that you were introducing and those were reversed. So uh, back at the time when the Toxic Substance Control Act and, and so on, when these were, were implemented in the 80s, in the late 70s and the 80s, was it was required for them to do studies to say that those chemicals were not hazardous or more hazardous than the ones they were replacing. And those laws were reversed through Congress and EPA, or sometimes they were just uh, presidential um, uh, orders. So this is ve actually very important, and I appreciate the council's looking into that and continuing with that. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor. I see no one else in the room wishing to provide public comment on closed session items. Thank you, we will now recess into closed session.
Welcome everyone to our November 26 Santa Rosa City Council meeting. It is now 4.01 and we will be starting our meeting. Seeing a quorum, Madam City Clerk, can you please call the roll? Thank you, Mayor. Councilmember Stapp? Here. Councilmember Rogers? Councilmember Okrepke? Here. Councilmember Fleming? Here. Councilmember Alvarez? Present. Vice Mayor McDonald? Here. Mayor Rogers? Present. Let the record show that all council members are present with the exception of Councilmember Chris Rogers. We have no study sessions today, so we'll move on to item five, which is our report on our closed session. Madam City Attorney? Thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, we had a closed session on the um, item 2.1 and 2.2. By a unanimous vote of the city council, the council decided to opt out of the two class action settlements with DuPont and 3M. The decision was based on the city council's concern that the city not prematurely settle until the city can better understand its potential claims as technology continues to evolve. Other than that, there is no reportable action to share. Madam City Clerk, can you please facilitate public comment on this item? We are now taking public comment on item five. If you'd like to provide public comment, please make your way to the podium. You will have three minutes and a countdown timer will alert at the end of that period. As you approach the podium, please provide your name for public record if you choose to do so. Mayor, I'm seeing no one approach the podium for item five. Thank you. We have no proclamations today, so we will continue on to item seven, which are our staff briefings. Madam City Manager. Good evening, Mayor, members of Council. Item 7.1 is the Transportation and Public Works Capital Projects Overview. Good evening, Mayor uh, Rogers, uh, Vice Mayor McDonald, members of the council. Um, I'm James Jensen. I'm the Deputy Director of Transportation and Public Works for Engineering Services. We're the division of TPW that delivers capital projects, uh, many for uh, our own department, but for other departments in the city. I'm joined this evening with two of our supervisors. To my left is Greg Mariscal. He's the supervising engineer in charge of Team One. And to his left is Lisa Welsh, the supervising engineer in charge of uh, Team Four. What we've prepared for you this evening is a um, statistical overview of the general what's going on with capital projects. So we're gonna provide some statistical data um, and we're gonna review basic prioritization criteria that can often come into play uh, that can kind of shuffle projects around a little bit. We're gonna present um, specific details of a couple of projects that we hope you find interesting. And we're gonna wrap up with soliciting feedback um, that we can use for future staff briefings. The objective is that we can bring this report forward um, twice a year, every six months, kind of as we exit construction season and as we get back into it, that'll be enough time for the data to change so that we can have new information to share. So uh, we hope you like this. Uh, just a quick overview of the project um, process. It's a fairly linear process. The planning and scoping of a project generally rests with our client departments um, where they identify the, the need of a project, start to scope the project and see what the actual need is. Um, that's when we'll get involved and we'll take over at the design stage which has 
various stages of quality control and quality assurance uh, nested within it. Um, it starts with what the development community sees as kind of a planning application, going through the CEQA process, developing a project enough to get to the point where you can prepare that environmental document. Um, we temporarily go pencils down once we have enough detail to prepare that document. Um, we let the CEQA process complete. And that's the reason that we stop there is the environmental analysis can result in a mitigation measure that could, if you went too far down a certain path, it could cause you to change tact deep into the project, which is, is not, not pleasant. Um, followed by the design process is construction, which is the exciting part, but also the most stressful for us and the community, um, followed by warranty. Um, currently, uh, we have 99 total active projects, and an active project we define as a project that's in design, construction, or warranty. Um, what we're looking at up here is um, a bar chart that shows the, the project volumes at different stages, and the orange bars are what we call TPW projects. Um, we also call them non-water, so that'll be road widenings, um, parks projects, fire stations, things of that nature. And then the blue bars are water projects, which are enterprise fund driven. Uh, we have 48 non-utility projects, and we have 51 utility projects. Um, the way that we're the way that we're organized is we have two delivery teams that handle the the orange bars, and we have two delivery teams that handle the blue bars. We average about five to eight projects per project manager, and we have typically three project managers per delivery team. Um, so, looking at this chart from left to right, this kind of gives you an idea of. Um, how the, how the projects kind of work through the process, what volumes we can expect to see coming up for, for future council action. Um, so the, the two bars on the left, 10 and 10 on, uh, for water and non-water, those are the projects that are starting the, proje uh, starting the process, we're developing enough information to get that environmental document complete, sometimes with, a, with an exemption, which is great, um, that those, those projects are, are still in what we would consider the, 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 the planning application stage. Um, as we work from left to right, the projects are working through a, um, a, f a percent completion process, which is where we take opportunities to circulate plans with our client departments, other stakeholders, um, and sometimes just other professionals that can help provide feedback. Um, and we, we increment the plans, specifications, and estimates uh, through this process. Once we reach 100%, um, assuming the project uh, doesn't require any further funding, it goes out to bid. Um, and then on the, on the right, we see 31 current projects in construction. Those are, those are projects that have public works contracts. And then we've got um, 14 projects that are in warranty. So when we're looking at this data here, it, it shows me that we're gonna have some projects going out to bid here um, in the next few months. Um, so there will be awards that we can expect to bring to council. We have um, a decent number of TPW side projects at 90%. So uh, we're gonna be wrapping up uh, quite a few projects and those will be hitting the street too. So um, over the next six months to a year, I think we can expect um, quite a bit of, of our items to be on, on consent and we're looking forward to that. Um, and then after that wave, there's gonna be a little bit of a, of a quiet period as, the, um, as a new wave of projects comes through. And um, I'm gonna move on. The, these next slides are not meant to force everybody to read a bunch of words on slides. Um, but the, um, this is just a, a list of, of the projects that we're working on. The idea here is that um, everyone can, can go back into the link on the presentation 
and, and read these lists. So we don't want everyone just to just read through these. Um, but there's a lot of signature projects here, um, the bicycle and pedestrian overcrossing, um, fire station five, um, the, the, the coffee park and Fountain Grove neighborhood road dis disaster recovery project. Uh, and the next slide here is it's just more more uh, project names for folks to be able to go back and, and read at their own convenience. Um, projects listed here with black text are TPW, and projects with blue text are water. And um, if you look at the water projects, there's a lot of cool technology, um, you know, booster stations, well rehabilitations, um, radio and, and PLC upgrades. Um, so, you know, engineer, I get, uh, I kind of geek out on, on reading those words, but a lot of high-end technology projects on the water side, which is very cool. Um, this is just a, a quick rundown of prioritization criteria that can often come into play. Um, so we, we look at things like asset management versus asset creation. Of course, funding adequacy, if, if two projects are ready to go, one of them is fully funded and the other one is waiting for another deposit on July 1, the funded one moves forward. Um, distributed benefit, which is related to the, the bottom criteria of growth and safety warrants. Um, traffic and utility models can can often generate projects that may be driven somewhat by development or other growth factors, um, and those those projects benefit large numbers of people, and those those types of projects often get priority for that. Um, a grant can come into play and um, bring a, a a timeline requirement that may or may not have been unexpected, but it can it can trigger a, a project kind of getting a fast pass. Um, the, the trump card will be regulatory mandate. Um, if, if there's a regulatory mandate that comes into play, um, those projects have compliance requirements, so those types of projects will get priority. Uh, risk mitigation um, is a factor as well, and, uh, and provision of core services. Um, something I'd like to mention is that we're looking, we're looking at these criteria and, and more um, to try to craft a little more, a, a less shot from the hip means of priority, uh, prior, prioritizing projects to um, build a more objective mechanism for um, our clients to bring projects forward with um, somewhat of an application that advocates the project in comparison to these criteria and we're working with um, our client departments um, with a, a, a working group or a task force that we've created to get our clients uh, in the room. We talk about these, these, um, these criteria. And so it's, it's taking time, we're getting there, um, but that is something that we're, we're doing in the background of, of all the other work that's going on. Next, I wanna look at construction contracts. We currently have 26 construction contracts. 10 of them are on the TPW side and 16 are on the water side. And you may ask, um, James, if we got 26 construction contracts, why did the other bar chart show 31 total projects? Um, that's because some of those projects are self-performed um, and not, not all of them have um, a public works construction contract associated with them. Um, on the TPW side, we have a total contract value of over 38 million. The largest uh, single contract in that volume is Fulton Road, 15 and a half million. And um, that we anxiously await the completion of that project. It's almost there. On the water side, we have a total volume of 106 million. The largest is the um, disinfection project out at the treatment plant, that's 68 million. Um, something I, I do want to make sure is understood here is that um, these numbers do not currently include um, staff time, soft cost associated with design, um, the, the construction management and inspection time that happens um, alongside the public works contract. Um, and I'm looking to get that included uh, in the future. The, the bar chart here just it shows volume um, for size of contracts. So we only have a couple of minor contracts, which I think right now is 
um, anything under 388,000. And then we have five projects that are major contracts, but less than a million. And then we have 19 major contracts that are greater than a million. So our, we're typically um, seeing large contracts. Um, next slide is similar to what I showed before for design. So it's just a list of projects for folks to um, have handy. These are the projects that are currently in construction. And again, um, black text is TPW. And on this slide is the blue text, that's uh, water. So that's just a, a, a general statistical overview of what we're working on. And now we're gonna give some insight into a couple of projects that we've hand selected to uh, provide some detail on that, that will have some, some upcoming action in the future. So with that, I'll give the floor to Greg. Thank you, James. Good evening, Mayor, Vice Mayor, and Council Members. Again, my name is Gregory Mariscal. I'm a supervising engineer in Capital Projects. Uh, the project I wanted to present uh, quickly for you guys is the Hopper uh, Avenue project. Uh, this is between Coffee Lane and the Highway 101. Uh, the project goals include working with the community and stakeholders to develop a collective vision. A vision that accommodates multiple mul uh, multiple modes of tra travel, including pedestrians, bicyclists, and vehicles, while at the same time calming measures to slow cars down without impacting emergency evacuation routes. We have hosted three community meetings with the public and have incorporated their feedback in the preferred design that you see now. Some of the enhanced features include proposing bulb outs at the intersection, high visibility crosswalks throughout, and buffered bike lanes with the inclusion of flexible bollards. Uh, in, in terms of funding, we are, funding uh, is coming from the pg e Settlement Funds. Uh, if you wanna go to the next slide, please. Uh, in terms of the delivery method, this, is, this will be a design build method and we are currently in preliminary design. Um, in terms of council action items, we would, we're planning to award construction contract in summer of 2024. The estimated construction cost is 4.9 million, that's what we're estimating currently. And in terms of the construction timeframe, uh, we are looking at fall 2025 to spring of 2026. And I will turn over to Lisa. Good evening, uh, Lisa Welsh, another supervising engineer in capital projects. Um, so I kind of wanted to highlight a little and then a big project on my side. Uh, so the little project uh, was Hernan Burbank traffic signal. It's a uh, just traffic signal installation at the intersection of Burbank and Hearn Avenue, Southwest Community Parks right there. And it's uh, met traffic warrants and is a, is, a, is a need for the area. So uh, one of those vital projects, but kind of little in the scheme, uh, $600,000 contract expected. Uh, we're gonna be bringing to you guys a request for an addendum to the 2016 Roseland Area Sebastopol Road specific plan and Roseland Area Annex EIR uh, in January. So I just wanted to give you a heads up on that. Um, so we're moving that one forward. Uh, next slide. Uh, so uh, the other project I highlighted, uh, Greg and I are working on, uh, and it's the Highway 101 bike and pedestrian overcrossing. This is a project that's been exciting and been in the works for a very long time. Uh, it's going to be, uh, the focus of it is for pedestrian and uh, bicycle traffic uh, to provide safe passage on the north side of Santa Rosa. It's uh, connecting uh, at the JC area and Conington Mall area. That's not the only impact it's hoping for. It's hoping to be globally the north part of Santa Rosa, kind of giving a safe route for those pedestrian and bicycle. Uh, and with that, I wanted to send a link to the website and shout out there. We actually have a two minute rendering video where you can actually walk through because it's so far along, we're about 95% designed. So you can walk through and it shows different angles and puts you in real life space into this one of a kind of bridge. Next slide. And then I just wanna quickly run through these facts. So we are going to traditional design bid build method. As Lisa mentioned, it's at 95% design. Uh, in terms of council action items, we are anticipating a uh, design amendment early next year 
and then for the construction contract uh, in fall of 2024. In terms of the construction cost, we are estimating between 29 and 31 million. I mean, there, there's also soft costs soft cost involved with this, but this is strictly construction costs that we're anticipating. And finally, the anticipated construction timeframe is fall 2024 to fall of 2026. Thank you, Greg, thank you, Lisa. And with that, uh, we'd like to hear your thoughts and feedback on what we can do for our next briefing in six months. Thank you. Thank you, thank you for being here and thank you for that presentation. Looking to Council Vice Mayor McDonald. Thank you so much for the presentation. I've been really wanting to have an update on our CIP project, so I really appreciate the overview of everything that's been happening. So a few things, comments, and a little bit of feedback for you. Um, I've been asking for us to have sort of an interactive map, maybe on our website, that everyone can see where the projects are taking place in the city of Santa Rosa. And I think that this helps for a lot of different reasons. One, taxpayers get to see where we're spending their money, and two, it's a communication tool if there's going to be extra traffic, specifically Fulton Road. In addition to that, I love the color coordinated um, presentation. Everything was in black for TPW, everything is in blue for water. But on our website, or even for council, I think it would be helpful to have a red, yellow, green system. Red, the project hasn't been started. Yellow, it's started, but it's not completed. And green, it's completed. And the reason I like this is because it's simple and I can explain it to constituents and we can explain it to community members and even to myself. This is where we're at on these projects. So I think anything that we can do, when you're looking at $145 million or just a hair over that in projects that we're doing around our city, I think we could do a better job communicating to everyone um, about what we're doing, including to me um, as, as a council member. So I think this would be really helpful. Okay, I'm not done, I wish, I wish I was, but I really feel pretty passionate about this one. The other thing that we don't have is a breakdown of where these projects are taking place. If you look in the budget book, it's hard, even though the little maps and pictures are all through it, you can't say this is in District 1 or this is in District 3 or wherever they're at around the city. And it's helpful, whether we have the integrated map or not, just to have a list of where the projects are in each of our districts so that we as council members can communicate out to all of our constituents, this is what's happening this year in our area, this is what's happening in the next three years or, or what have you. Um, I do really like, the, the whole presentation was very helpful, just the overview of what we're doing in water and in TPW. And then I just have a couple questions for you now. I see that the hopper landscaping is being um, something that you acknowledged in this, and I know if you go over Fountain Grove, you can see a ton of landscaping that's being done and it looks beautiful and I appreciate that. But is there any cost that's integrated into this about how we're going to maintain that or who maintains that after we plant all these beautiful plants and have that done? Or is this under your department or does it fall under somebody else? Uh, median landscaping is traditionally um, held by parks. Okay, and so that isn't taken into account when we're looking at the CIP projects? right, just actually planting it and getting it taken care of. Correct. Okay, thank you. I wanted to know how that was all budgeted for after the fact, and if it's being budgeted for as well to maintain the look. Vice Mayor McDonald, we can expand on that question if I could get Assistant City Manager Nutt uh, to explain how we're gonna handle the maintenance moving forward, please. It looks beautiful now, I just wanna make sure it stays that way. Jason Nutt, Assistant City Manager. Uh, thank you, uh, Vice Mayor McDonald, for that question. Uh, it, it is true when we go through the construction project, we incorporate the maintenance departments uh, so that they are aware of what's coming forward. It gives them the opportunity to begin planning for what's going to come. However, it's not initially incorporated into their budget. So once we get closer to completion of a project, we look to make either amendments into the contract services or into the services that are that are on the ground with the staff members that we have 
have in place. Uh, so that will come, for example, for Hopper, if we're completing in 26, there'll be a dialogue in, uh, earlier that year or the prior year starting to develop what's the cost of doing the ongoing maintenance. Um, Right now, we don't have a clear and final design on every plant species that's going to be there. They're developing that right now with the contractor or with the, with the consultant. So uh, until we get all of that final document in place, it's very difficult for us to turn to the park maintenance team and say, okay, develop a cost estimate for us. Here's what this is going to cost us in the long, uh, on an annual basis moving forward. But we do provide that information to them up front as far as the design so that they can start to anticipate. Thank you, and thank you again for the overall presentation. I appreciate it. Are there any additional questions or comments from council members? No, I, I did have a quick question. Uh, so when we look at the CIP and we know that there are big projects, how does the public know that we are being responsive to, let's say, small projects like potholes right outside there? their area that they drive all the time, which may not be a big project, but for someone that hits a pothole quite often when they're pulling out of their subdivision, it may be big for them. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, this is an area that we're starting to do a better job at noting. Uh, those types of day-to-day -day maintenance activities are starting to show up on an integrate on a, a dynamic website that we have that relates to our service and work order system. Uh, and we are creating a dashboard right now that starts to dem to starts to show where those locations are. Um, we're, in the, we're still refining how that's going to look. For example, when we send a crew out on a day to do potholing, they may actually fill 80 potholes uh, in that one day, and it's hard to identify at the specific location for each of those 80 spots for that one crew that's out there. Uh, doesn't mean it's infeasible, it means that that's part of the work that we're doing so that we can better answer your question. What it will show is on this particular date, crews were out filling potholes in response to the following service requests. And so if you had submitted a pothole request, you should be able to receive feedback that states your pothole is filled on that day. We're trying to relate that specific location to the map itself, and that's work that we're doing right now. Does that answer your question? It definitely does. And uh, can you please remind council and also members of the public how is it that they put in a service request if they have such? Yeah, we have an app uh, that you can use on your uh, either Apple or uh, uh, Android device, which is the My Santa Rosa app. Uh, it's also available through the city's website. Uh, the interface is the same uh, and it gives you the opportunity to report a wide variety of different uh, concerns uh, or complaints or request service for different types of activities. Uh, for example, a pothole or graffiti abatement or if there's debris along a roadside, it would give you the opportunity to describe in more detail where, the, where that is and crews will provide a response once they've had the opportunity to get it in the queue for work. Perfect, thank you so much. And looking at council to see if there are any additional questions or comments. Uh, thank you for being here for the presentation, that was great. And Madam City Clerk, may you please facilitate public comment on this item. Thank you, Mayor. We are now taking public comment on item 7.1. If you'd like to make a public comment, please make your way to the podium. You'll have three minutes and a countdown timer will alert at the end of that period. As you approach the podium, please provide your name for public record if you choose to do so. Can we use the overhead? Certainly. Did you turn the power button on? Oh, or right. share at the top of the wall? Can you help? Thank you. And then share. Thank you. There we go. Okay. Um, actually, so this is Santa Rosa, and it shows the USGS quadrangle map for south of town. Um, you can see 101 was 
improved to cure, um, but it was not elevated, I believe, at that point. Um, what I'm pointing out here is that this is Hearn Avenue, and this is Kiwana Springs, and this is Yolanda, and something happened. So I can't show what I'm trying to show. Uh, and, the, and from that time, they were always problematic as far as getting across town east and west, but there weren't very many people that lived there. So I want to point out that uh, by my analysis that I found uh, in, the, in the southwest, there are seven crossings of 12 and 101 and 24 lanes. In the southeast, there are 13 crossings and 37 lanes that you can actually use. In the northwest, there are 13 crossings similarly, but there are 56 lanes that you can use. And in the northeast, there are 19 crossings and 69 lanes that you can evacuate and, and do the things you need to do on a daily basis, whether it's going to school, going to the JC or anything. You can't really do that. That's what I was saying about building a wall around Gaza. This is a kind of a Gaza place. Um, one and a, uh, twice as many crossings and half again as many lanes. Um, Two and a half times as many crossings and three times as many lanes as the as the Southwest has, and twice as many crossings and and more than double the number of lanes for the Northwest than the Southwest has. And this is a legacy, and 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 people have said that it's a legacy. That the fact was it wasn't in the city, so it wasn't the city's responsibility to do something about it initially. But in fact, it was their responsibility to annex, and then it would have been their responsibility. And so by not annexing, then they have done this, uh, a tragedy really. Uh, in fact, Bicentennial was a product of shenanigans down here with regard to Bellevue, a proposal for Bellevue that really would never have occurred. But it was a potential, and gee, maybe that'll happen, and, and, and we won't need to do Hearn, but that never was accurate. And um, magically, Bicentennial gets constructed, the Bicentennial Overcrossing, suitable for the county, and isn't that wonderful for Fountain Grove? Uh, this is the proposal that would be a diverging diamond design. Oops, we lost everything again. We'd like to have my time back to recover the time. Oops. Um, so the existing design is here. The existing herd is here and the existing design is here. And the other part. Thank you. Next speaker, please, from the west or east lectern. Okay. Thank you. Is this, do I make sure it's on? It's on, you just have to get uncomfortably close to the microphone. Uncomfortably close, there we go. Okay, thank you very much. Um, I'm Peter Allen, president of the Wild Oak Homeowners Association. And um, I walked in while there was a discussion about making uh, <clears throat> the progress of city projects more transparent for all of us to look at. And I, and I'm, and I really wanna support that. Thank you for your efforts on that. I also um, wanted to support Vice Mayor um, Diane McDonald's um, efforts to make it even more transparent. So thank you. Um, I just had a question uh, about making, how to make a service request. I heard the description on how to do it. Could you tell me one more time so I can be sure to write it down? I'm internet challenged sometimes. I go to the city's portal, that, that, where does it start? I believe that was my Santa Rosa app that you can download on either an Android or your iPhone. Oh, okay, say that again, I didn't understand. It's My Santa Rosa app. My Santa Rosa, mm -hmm. okay, My Santa Rosa app. Yes, when you go in the app store. Okay, go to the app store, okay, very good. Uh-huh, and then you can download it there. But if okay. you need additional help, I'm sure someone will be happy to help and they are right behind you on their way. Okay. Okay. Right. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Okay. Everybody, I'll be back for another step. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor. I see no one else wishing to provide public comment. 
Thank you. We will now continue to item eight, which is our city manager and city attorney's report. We will start off with our city manager. Thank you, Mayor. So our Santa Rosa Transit Department is partnering with uh, Toys for Tots, Stuff the Bus Holiday Toy Drive event this Saturday. The event is from 9 a.m. to 3 p.m. It will be here in front of City Hall. So I encourage everyone to get into the holiday spirit, donate some toys, um, unwrap toys, uh, games, sports entertainment, shoes, clothing, uh, whatever your uh, heart desires. Also happening this weekend is the 48th Handmade Holiday Crafts Fair. That is located at the Finley Community Center. It is from 10 to 4 on both Saturday and Sunday. And this is uh, one of our traditional holiday events. It's hosted by the Recreation and Parks Department, and it features over 90 local artists, and the entry fee is $5. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Mayor. I have no report this evening. Thank you. Madam City Clerk, can you please facilitate public comment? Thank you. We are now taking public comment on item eight. If you'd like to make a comment, please make your way to the podium. You will have three minutes and a countdown timer will alert at the end of that period. As you approach the podium, please provide your name for public record if you choose to do so. Oh, hello. Um, Mayor, it looks like there are no public comments from the chamber. Thank you. Looking at council to see if there are any abstentions that need to be made. Council Member Alvarez. Uh, thank you, Mayor. I'll be abstaining from item 14.1 because I'm involved in the cannabis industry. Thank you. Now we will move on to Mayor and Council Members reports. Vice Mayor McDonald. Thank you, Mayor. I have a couple of things to report on, on Zero Waste Met, and I want to thank Renee Gundy for her representation while I was away at a city conference. Um, we authorized um, to enter into a purchase agreement to acquire three and a half acres for $3 million out on Pruitt Avenue in Windsor. Um, we adopted a green resolution recognizing Green Mary, and a green resolution so for zero waste to recognize entities that exemplify zero waste practices. Um, in the executive director report, the airport compost facility project was going to the Board of Supervisors in January, and this is a partnership between the county and Zero Waste Sonoma to bring compost back to the county. And then um, I also had just a couple highlights. I attended the National League of Cities Conference in Atlanta, and a few of the workshops that I attended was on integrated data and public safety, um, drones as first responders, and a presentation on youth violence and prevention and strategies. And so I'm, I'm able to come back and bring some of those things to um, the various departments that they'll be under. And then another highlight was that we were able to meet with the Department of Transportation um, to have a conversation with them that I thought went very well. And then I just wanna do a public thank you to my colleagues. I ended up getting very sick at the conference with Vertigo and all of them had to literally get me back to the hotel hotel and deal with me for several hours and so just publicly I want to thank you all who attended and had to deal with me. Um, it really meant a lot to know that you're there for me, not just on the dais but also when I needed you all. So thank you. It was quite an event. Do we have any other seeing none? Madam City Clerk, can you please facilitate public comment? Yes, Mayor, we are now taking public comment on item 10. If you'd like to make a comment, please make your way to the podium. You will have three minutes and a countdown timer will alert at the end of that period. As you approach the podium, please provide your name for public record if you choose to do so. Mayor, I'm seeing no one approach the podiums for public comment. 
Thank you. Uh, item 10.2, which will be our election of vice mayor. Um, we will address this item after our last public comment on non-agenda matters, item 17. So we will table that for now and move on to item 11, which will um, be our approval of minutes for November 14th, 2023. Council, are there any corrections to the minutes? All right, seeing none, Madam City Clerk, can you please facilitate public comment? We are now taking public comments on item 11.1. .1. If you'd like to make a comment, please make your way to the podium. You will have three minutes and a countdown timer will alert at the end of that period. As you approach the podium, please provide your name for public record. Mayor, I am seeing no one approach the podium for public comment on 11.1. .1. Thank you. Um, we will now adopt item 11.1 .1 as presented. Moving on to our consent items. Madam City Clerk, can you please read the consent items? Yes. Item 12.1, resolution, approval and adoption of the city salary plan and schedule. Item 12.2, resolution, approval of a second amendment to professional services agreement with Green Valley Consulting Engineers Incorporated, Construction Management and Inspection Services Associated with Fire Damage Roadway Landscaping. Item 12.3, Ordinance Adoption Second Reading, Ordinance of the Council of the City of Santa Rosa amending Title 20 of the Santa Rosa City Code to extend the expiration date of Zoning Code Chapter 20-16, Resilient City Development Measures and Zoning Code Section 20-28.1. 100 Resilient City RC Combining District by one year from December 31st, 2023 to December 31st, 2024. Thank you. Bringing it back to council, are there any questions on the consent items? All right, seeing no questions, Madam City Clerk, may you please facilitate public comment on this item. We are now taking public comment on item 12, the consent calendar. Please make your way to the podium if you'd like to provide a comment. You will have three minutes and a countdown timer will alert at the end of that period. As you approach the podium, please provide your name for public record if you choose to do so. Mayor, I'm seeing no one approach the podiums for public comment on consent. Thank you. Acknowledging this will be your last consent items that you will uh, put before us, Vice Mayor McDonald, can you please make a motion? Thank you, Mayor. I move items 12.1 through 12.3. Second. We have a motion made by Vice Mayor McDonald and a second made by Council Member Rogers. Madam City Clerk, may you please call the vote. Thank you, Council Member Stapp. Aye. Council Member Rogers. Aye. Council Member Okrepke. Aye. Council Member Fleming. Aye. Council Member Alvarez. Aye. Vice Mayor McDonald. Aye. Mayor Rogers. Aye. Let the record show that passes unanimously. Thank you. Uh, being as though it is not five o'clock and we cannot have our uh, first public comment on non-agenda matters, we will now go to our report items. Uh, and we are going to start with item 14.1, that's fine. Item 14.1 is a report, Cannabis Equity Assessment. Good afternoon, Mayor Rogers and members of the council. Uh, my name is Jessica Jones. I'm the Deputy Director of Planning. Um, with me tonight is, or this afternoon, is Monet Shikali, a senior planner here uh, with the city who has been focusing on our cannabis program. And we also have our uh, consultant for this project, um, Kyle Tankard, uh, who is with SCI Consulting Group. Uh, so they will be doing the presentation for you and then we'll be available for any questions. Thank you, Jessica. Uh, good evening, Ms. Smith and Ma Ma Mayor Rogers and council members. So as Jessica said, we are going to present our cannabis equity assessment tonight. 
So I will give a quick background about the equity grant and the, about the equity act and the grant, and then our consultant Carl will give you an overview of the assessment and its results and the next steps, and then staff will go over the timing. So about the equity grant, I have to read my notes for, that, for this act. So the, the Equity Act was signed into law by the state of California to address the harm caused by the war on the drugs and um, to increase the participation in the cannabis industry by marginalized and economically disadvantaged, disadvantaged individuals and communities who have been impacted by cannabis criminalizations. So as a result of this in 2019, DCC entered into an interagency agreement with uh, GOBIS to administer a cannabis equity grant that would assist local jurisdictions with grants to help equity, uh, equity applicants. And about this grant, this grant has two types. A type one that would provide assistance to local jurisdictions to conduct an assessment and to, or to develop a program. And then there's a type two that would provide local with a grant to help equity applicants. In 2021, the city applied for a type one grant. And in March of 2022, we received a $75,000 to conduct the assessment that we are going to present it tonight. So the purpose of this session is to present you the equity assessment and its results, and then tell you about the next steps and ask for direction. And with that, I will pass it to Kyle. Thank you. Thank you, Monet. Uh, good evening, Mayor Rogers, members of the council, staff, and the public. Uh, so Kyle Tankard, senior consultant and cannabis policy leader with SCI Consultant Group. Uh, so over the uh, past year, we have been working closely with staff and the community to prepare a cannabis equity assessment. Uh, so tonight I will provide an overview of that assessment along with the key findings and recommendations from that report. Um, so I'd like to, like to begin by briefly outlining the focus on social equity in the cannabis industry and our goals for a local cannabis equity program uh, here in the city of Santa Rosa. Uh, so, so the cannabis prohibition era had a profound impact on communities, uh, particularly, particularly people of color in California and here in Santa Rosa. Uh, Proposition 64's legalization of recreational cannabis and the commercial cannabis industry um, aimed to uh, address the past injustices, eliminate barriers, um, but has failed to effectively diversify the now billion dollar cannabis industry and provide opportunities uh, for those who have been impacted by the war on drugs. Um, so our approach to developing an equity program involves four key steps. Uh, so step one, outreach and education. Two, the cannabis equity assessment three, program development, and four, program implementation. Uh, so to facilitate the development um, and guidance of the equity assessment, we engaged in community outreach efforts. Uh, this outreach included an online survey, a virtual community, community meeting and interviews with uh, key stakeholders. Uh, the city also developed a, a page on their website uh, to post information about the can cannabis assessment we were producing. Um, so the primary objective of the cannabis equity assessment is to examine the historical consequences of cannabis related policies and illegal legalization on communities and populations uh, within the city. Uh, so by analyzing police statistics, demographics, poverty rates, and other relevant factors, uh, we aim to pinpoint uh, communities uh, within the city that have been disproportionately impacted by the war on drugs. Um, so by understanding the barriers to entry into the cannabis industry, uh, the, the report offers uh, key policy uh, suggestions and recommendations to guide the city when they develop their equity program. Uh, so very quickly, this graphic illustrates our analysis process for the assessment. Uh, so one, identify disparities. Uh, two, map arrest hotspots or locations. Uh, three, bring in uh, low income data, um, other demographic information, and then overlay this, 
information on one, onto one map to identify uh, impacted communities. Um, so starting with the ethnic and racial distribution of the population uh, within the city, uh, for people reporting uh, one race alone, 62% are white, 34% uh, are Hispanic or Latino, 6% uh, are Asian, 2% are black or African American, 1.2% are American Indian and Alaska, Alaska Native, and 0.4% are Native Hawaiian and other Pacific Islander. Um, so in our analysis, we examined uh, the historical cannabis-related arrest in the city spanning from a period of 2004 to uh, the current year 2023. Uh, so throughout this time frame, a total of 4,781 cannabis-related arrests were recorded citywide. Thanks. Um, so in, in evaluating these cannabis-related arrests in the city, uh, we compared the arrest percentages uh, to the demographic uh, populations. Uh, so um, as you can see on this table and in this graph, uh, uh, Caucasian white individuals c constituted for 52.6% of the arrests, uh, followed by Hisp Hispanic Latino indiv individuals at 33%, and black African-American individuals at 9.4%. Um, what stands out here um, and what the data shows us is this disproportionate arrest rates for black African-American individuals um, who only uh, make up 2% of the city's population but accounted for 9.4% of the arrests, um, nearly five uh, times their rep representation in the city's total population. Uh, whereas if you look at the other uh, uh, demographic groups, um, the arrest rates align more closely with their uh, population proportions. Um, so to identify the uh, disproportionately affected communities, um, a geospatial analysis um, of the arrest locations was conducted considering three factors, uh, the presence of people, people of color populations, uh, low income populations, and educational, educational attainment levels at the census tract level. Um, so this first map shows the uh, concentration of non-white residents in Santa Rosa. Um, so looking at the map, you can see that the southwest and southeast census tracts have the highest uh, concentration of non-white residents uh, with populations ranging between 50 to 100%. Um, the green dots on this map indicate locations of cannabis-related uh, arrests. Um, so, so as you can see on the map, the highest concentration of maps are, 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 are of arrests are concentrated in areas where there are higher uh, populations of people of color. And then uh, going to the uh, eastern side of the city, uh, you'll see uh, less concentration of arrests. Uh, this next map shows uh, the uh, uh, proportion of low-income households in, in the city of Santa Rosa by census tract. Uh, so most areas have 25% uh, or fewer low-income low households, um, indicating relatively low poverty uh, concentration citywide. However, uh, uh, census tract 151406 uh, uh, in the southwest um, area of the city uh, stands out to us. Um, having the highest concentration um, at 52%. Additionally, the southwest and southeast areas have 25% uh, to 50% uh, low-income households, again correlating with the higher percentage of non-white populations as well as the uh, number of uh, cannabis-related arrests. And then lastly, um, so, so I apologize in advance, uh, this map is the same as the previous slides, but it is correct in your, your staff report as well as the assessment. Um, but this map displays the uh, percentage of individuals aged uh, 25 years or older without a high school diploma in Santa Rosa's uh, census tracts. Um, so most areas across the city show high educational attainment levels, um, but again, exceptions uh, exist in the southwest, um, some areas in the northwest, as well as central areas, uh, where concentrations between 25% to 50% of individuals lack high school 
diplomas. Um, again, these regions also have high concentrations of non-white, uh, low-income households, hi highlighting the connection between uh, education, race, and uh, socioeconomic status. Um, so the, the highest percentage of cannabis-related arrests were recorded in census tracts 152000 uh, and 153002, uh, accounting for 14% and 8% of the uh, total arrests, uh, respectively. Uh, notably, these two uh, tracts are both located within the uh, Midwestern regions of the city. Um, this region um, uh, is the area of the city that we have identified as being disproportionately affected uh, given the convergence of the factors such as high rates of cannabis-related arrests, uh, significant non-white population, and the prevalence of low-income uh, households. Um, so the, uh, uh, the equity assessment identifies uh, census tracts, uh, again, in, in the western and central side of the city with uh, economic and uh, social uh, disadvantages uh, where, where uh, majority of the cannabis arrests were concentrated. Um, and the analysis of the cannabis-related arrest uh, reveals a disparity, partic particularly uh, impacting black African-American uh, individuals whose arrest rates were nearly five times higher than their popula population representation. And so the uh, cannabis equity assessment discusses barriers to entry into the cannabis industry um, that impacted individuals face when trying to enter the industry. Um, so the barriers can be summarized into the following categories, uh, financial, technical, criminal, and other. Um, so one of the goals of the city's equity program uh, will be to reduce and to eliminate uh, these barriers to entry through the services that are provided by the program. Uh, so financial challenges uh, included uh, limited access to capital and past uh, criminal histories hinder uh, financing opportunities as well as um, property leasing opportunities. Uh, technical barriers encomp uh, encompass uh, a lack of business skills or industry expertise, um, which are only compounded by the uh, complex local and state uh, cannabis regulations. And then lastly, the transition from the illicit to the legal uh, markets faces uh, trust issues uh, between affected communities that have borne the, the the brunt of the uh, cannabis enforcement and, and the government. Um, so our analysis identified, um, or our, our analysis of the barriers to entry and our review of equity programs that have been uh, established elsewhere in the state uh, inform potential um, equity program services to address the financial, the technical, and knowledge-based barriers for equity applicants. Um, so financial is, assistance is crucial. Um, so we uh, suggest that the city consider establishing some form of loan or grant program. Uh, from all the outreach we did, uh, financial assistance was by far the largest barrier facing um, individuals. Um, so loan and grant programs would offer essential financial support for startup licensing and operational costs. Um, lo loans uh, could include low interest or even no interest loans, uh, while grants would provide uh, non-repayable funds to applicants. Um, additionally, a comprehensive technical assistance program is recommended. Uh, this would be a tailored curriculum uh, uh, tailored to uh, business development, uh, industry-specific training, and legal support for applicants. Uh, really here the goal um, is to equip applicants with the skills, the knowledge, um, and the resources necessary to uh, open up and operate a successful cannabis business. And then ongoing support, uh, including mentorship, uh, networking opportunities, access to industry experts, um, uh, legal assistance would ensure the long-term uh, su success of these businesses. And lastly, ongoing outreach, education, awareness campaigns um, are crucial for the uh, equities program's uh, success. Uh, so next I will transition to the top line findings from the report. 
Uh, so finding number one, equity program eligibility criteria should focus on the inclusion of populations in communities uh, disproportionately impacted by cannabis enforcement. Uh, so careful consideration should be placed on uh, when developing and establishing the eligibility criteria for the, for the program, first and foremost, uh, the requirement should focus on serving the communities and populations that have been impacted. Uh, the, the requirement should be adequately uh, structured uh, to capture the majority of these individuals that have been previously impacted. Uh, so we recommend that the, consider, uh, the city consider the following criteria. So uh, a prior cannabis conviction or arrest history, uh, this can extend to immediate uh, family members, a low income status, um, a residency requirement. So uh, either being a previous resident or a current resident of the city of Santa Rosa or even owning and operating a, a different business here in the city. And then the last one is equity business ownership percentage. Um, uh, so essentially this is a threshold a requirement that an equity applicant must maintain a certain percentage of their business um, whether that's 51% or greater to avoid um, some of the, the predatory uh, investors uh, that we've seen elsewhere in the state with equity programs that use equity applicants to get licenses and take, end up taking advantage of them down the road. Uh, so finding number two is the equity uh, program application and permanent process should be structured to ensure equity applicant success and incentivize ongoing support. Um, so the city should consider um, priority application and permanent processing for equity applicants, moving them to the front of the line, and then potentially uh, considering a amnesty program for um, non-permitted businesses who are currently operating to uh, guide them to the compliant regulated market. And then finding number three is the uh, city's equity program must develop and implement benefit, benefits and services for um, equity applicants that address and mitigate the barriers to entry. Um, so, so as a kind of a bottom line, we uh, recommend that the city provide the following services, so fee waivers, uh, grant, a grant program, and a technical assistance program. Finding four, a uh, criminal history can limit an individual's uh, ability to gain employment and apply for government assistance and or obtain a loan. Uh, so the city, uh, we recommend that the city look into a uh, cannabis uh, expungement program uh, in collaboration with uh, relevant partners like the district attorney's office and the courts. Um, uh, this initiative is aimed at um, assisting individuals um, from these impacted areas, um, expunging those uh, past cannabis uh, uh, offenses from their criminal records. And then finding number five is to advance workforce uh, development opportunities in the cannabis industry. Um, so a, a lack of training for uh, well-paying jobs is a common barrier in the cannabis industry and other industries alike. Um, so prioritizing workforce development in the industry um, can boost the involvement and success of impacted communities uh, enhancing their participation uh, in the cannabis uh, related opportunities. And then finding number six is equity program funding. Uh, so adequate funding and a well-equipped staff are crucial for the success of an equity program. Um, other mi municipalities um, experiences show that having a uh, uh, that lacking this uh, supportive infrastructure can um, hinder uh, those programs and cause setbacks along the way. Um, to address this, this sh the city should uh, continue to uh, pursue grants like those offered by GoBiz, um, as well as um, um, other, uh, other uh, sources. Um, relying solely on the state grants isn't sustainable for the city in the long run. Um, so down the road, the city should consider di diversifying those funds and possibly uh, uh, looking to tap into the cannabis tax reven revenue or exploring al alternative uh, financial avenues. 
Find, and lastly, finding number seven is to uh, conduct public outreach and education uh, to increase awareness of the equity program and reduce the social stigma uh, regarding cannabis. Um, so through community meetings, workshops, uh, a strong presence with uh, media and public relations as well as uh, social media as well and an online presence to um, advertise and um, uh, communicate about the city's equity program. Uh, so the next steps for staff and the city are as follows, uh, to develop the equity program, adopt, adopt a cannabis equity program, um, to implement that program, and then to apply for uh, grant funding. Uh, so following council's approval of the cannabis equity establishment, um, if given the direction, staff would proceed with the development of the equity program. Uh, this process involves uh, crafting the program guidelines, uh, determining the responsible city uh, division or department that would oversee the uh, program. Um, additionally, staff would uh, draft a policy document or an ordinance uh, that would come back for council approval that would outline the eligibility criteria, the services and benefits that would be provided by the program, and establish the protocols for administering, monitoring, and um, updating the program. And then uh, upon completion of the adoption process, the city would then be eligible to apply for the uh, type two grant funding um, via the uh, cannabis equity grants uh, program for local jurisdictions. And so again, the eligibility criteria deter uh, determines who qualifies to participate in the city's program. Um, upon meeting these criteria and gaining admission to the city's program, uh, participants will gain access to all the support services offered by the city's equity program. And then lastly, um, in addition to the type one funding that the city has already received, once the city's program has been adopted, uh, the city is eligible to apply for type two fund funding from the state. Um, so each year, the grant solicitation period opens up in October uh, with applications due uh, sometime in mid-December. Um, the city can seek up to uh, uh, $3 million in uh, financial support through the, the Type 2 grant to fund and administer their, pro their uh, equity program. However, it's essential to note um, that uh, grant awards in excess of $500,000 require a one-to-one -one matching fund contribution from the city uh, during that grant term. Um, in addition, the uh, guidelines uh, set up by the state specify that no more than 10% of the grant award received by the city can be allocated for administration and no more than 10% of that grant can be used for uh, direct technical assistance or hiring outside consultants uh, to provide those services. Uh, so with that, I will turn the presentation back over to staff to conclude. All right, thank you for that. So I'm just gonna quickly uh, go over the timeline here and then I'm gonna hand it over to Monet for the recommendation. Um, so as was just outlined um, in the next steps, um, the next step should council wanna proceed would be uh, staff drafting a cannabis equity program uh, that would include all the criteria um, and eligibility requirements uh, within it. Prior to doing that though, um, one of the things that we will be looking at is determining um, which department and staff um, here at the city uh, would be best to administer that program. One, develop the, the draft program to bring forward to council and then ultimately to administer that program. So we'll be looking at that first um, and then we'll, planning will continue to work with you know whoever is determined to be the subject matter expert for this next step uh, to develop that program. And so that process will happen um, uh, winter and spring um, into 2024. Um, in the summer of 2024, that draft program will be brought forward to council for your consideration. Um, and that would include, at that point, a determination of how many businesses uh, could potentially be um, eligible for the program, which would ultimately give us an idea of the staff uh, time that would be needed uh, to administer the program. So all that information would be brought forward 
to you for your consideration in the summer of 2024 so you can make a decision at that point as to whether you want to move forward with that type two grant. Um, if the council directs staff to proceed, um, then we would be preparing that application um, for ultimate submittal in December of 2024. Um, so with that, I'm gonna hand it over to Monet for the recommendation. And with that, it is recommended by the Planning and Economic Development Department that Council by resolution accept the City of Santa Rosa Cannabis Equity Assessment and to direct staff to prepare a Type 2 grant application. Thank you. Thank you for that very thorough presentation. Um, I did have a, a question. Uh, who conducted the assessment and analysis? It was not done in-house. Uh, so that was conducted by SCI Consulting Group. Okay, and SCI Consulting Group, when they were picked, was it looked at to see what their diversity, um, like if they were diverse or if they actually, if there were consultants that met some of the criteria that we would actually be looking at? Oh, here is what I remember. Uh, we received three applications that we interviewed and we chose CSI Group, SC, SC, SCI Group. So I can't remember what we look at exactly, but the application that this receiver three and we interviewed two out of three and we chose only one. Okay, uh, it's just important to me that if we're looking uh, for someone to look into equity, that maybe we can, when picking consultants, can also look at um, equity to see if they, to make it equitable across, across the board. Um, and then also, how are the key stakeholders identified? Um, so those the key stakeholders were identified through multiple avenues. Uh, so we reached out to the current uh, cannabis business owners in the city um, through the uh, survey uh, that was released to the general public. Uh, uh, folks that were interested had the opportunity to uh, put their contact information and participate in those one-on-one -on -one stakeholder interviews. And then during the community meeting, the individuals that showed up were also again offered that opportunity. Um, so we had folks that uh, currently operate uh, businesses. I spoke to a gentleman that uh, is in an equity program in the city of San, uh, San Francisco. I spoke to uh, someone representing a law firm um, uh, individuals that own and operate technical assistance programs for um, um, equity applicants uh, up and down the state. So a, a wide variety of, of individuals uh, provided feedback. Okay, I just, when we're looking at all the dots on the map, I wanna make sure that those, uh, the people within those areas were reached out to and actually included. Uh, we see a lot of times that we can publish stuff or invite people somewhere, but unless we go to where uh, people are that we're trying to target, um, we don't always get that feedback that we want. Um, and then, I think that is good for me. Are there any other questions from council members? Council member Sapp. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, a few questions. Do we have any demographic data re regarding our existing cannabis business permit holders? Uh, we have information about location of the dispensaries and we have the list of uh, cannabis applicants for cultivation and manufacture dispensaries and distributions. So we have the list and data, but we have only the map for dispensaries currently. Okay, so we don't have the same kind of demographic data that we do for, for arrests, for example. For what? For, for arrests, for example, where it was broken down into different demographic categories. We didn't find out, no. Um, question number two, do we, have, do we have any data regarding the effect of cannabis businesses on neighborhood revitalization? Are there some success stories out there that show that encouraging cannabis specific operations leads to good outcomes in neighborhoods? I don't have any. Okay. Um, a couple more questions here. Is there a tension pursuing this kind of policy, given that just in, in our last council meeting, we per, were pursuing a very different policy with respect to tobacco, where we're looking to limit the sales of various kinds of tobacco process or products, but, but now we're looking to encourage the growth of cannabis? I, I don't have any answer for that, no. 
Okay. With respect to staff resources, if we really did ramp up this program, how significant are the staff resources and, and, and also the likely budget resources given that the state grants are require one-to-one -one match? So that's something that we would be looking um, into should the council wanna proceed with developing a program. At this point, we don't have an answer to that. Um, we do know that the program only provides a 10% um, allocation towards um, staff administration of the grant. Um, and we did reach out to the county and spoke to their uh, the person that runs their program. Um, and there is a, they have a significant amount of staff time that you know goes towards that. It really depends on the number of, uh, of uh, businesses that come into the program and, and utilize it. And so we will have an answer for that when we bring the program back should the council wanna proceed. Perfect, thank you. That's it for me. Vice Mayor. Thank you, Mayor. So I have a couple different questions for you. Um, there was some data around the arrests that went up to 2023. Um, because cannabis has been legalized since 2016, was there any data that showed what the arrests were for prior to that versus what they were for after 2016 to 2023? Because I felt like that information wasn't clear. It just showed there was something related to cannabis. So I'm kind of curious what that was. So, so are you asking f uh, post legalization or? Yeah, or what are we arresting people for post legalization from 2016? Yeah, so I, I would have to go back through the data that we received um, from the um, police department. I'm not sure if it detailed the types of infractions. We could probably request that information to see if they have that, um, but you know, Looking at the peak in the cannabis arrests, you know, it peaked in 2010, and then from uh, 2016, um, moving forward, it dropped drastically. Um, so likely those, uh, you know, those arrests are, uh, you know, possession with the, the intent to sell illegally or operate in a uh, illegal cannabis business. I'm having a tough time understanding how arrests prior to legalization and opening businesses relates to something that we're trying to do potentially now. That's hard for me to understand why we would um, have data that was based on old laws versus what we're looking at right now. So that, that's a tough one for me to try to say, oh, we should definitely legalize more or have more businesses of cannabis um, distribution because this helps some old arrests that were done prior to legalization. I'm having a hard time tying those two things together, so I'm not sure if you can explain it to me or not. But I have a couple more questions here as we go along. Maybe that'll help my brain process this a little. Um, one of the barriers that I understand is around banking, and that wasn't mentioned here because it's a high cash business. Do we have any way that that's legalized because of FDIC and the regulations from the um, federal level? Is there a bank in California that's going to be taking on these expanded cannabis businesses or how is that working currently? Yes, yeah, so currently uh, federal banking is not an option. Uh, there are credit unions um, up and down the state that do accept uh, cannabis businesses, so that is uh, you know one avenue for them. Um, what's our current return on investment right now for the cannabis business? I mean, I know there's a high tax, but I'm not certain that that high tax goes right back to the city of Santa Rosa. So if it's a high tax, um, because of it, is it state and federal that get the tax? You know, I, I'm looking to Alan right behind you who's shaking his head yes, who's our CFO. So it, when I hear about us matching grants on this kind of business, I guess my question is, would we be getting any more from this business than any other business in the city of Santa Rosa? Or is it simply because the state is offering a grant for us to help promote this because the state receives more money on their tax take? While staff comes to the podium, I do want to answer one question. So cannabis equity programs were implemented by race one. It was designed to address the disproportionate impacts of the law, the drugs, um, the impacts that drug laws had on uh, certain communities, right? Um, specifically communities of colors. Um, so 
back when we had the war on drugs, there was a higher arrest rate, arrest rate for people of color. So when they started to legalize cannabis, they wanted to make certain that those people who had been disproportionately impacted were allowed to enter the market. Okay, that helps clarify some of my questions then to see that we're not having a barrier for the people that were adversely affected by this industry in the past or not the industry in the past, but actually arrested. Okay, that, that helps clarify some of my questions. One other question is how many cannabis distrib distri um, distributions, what are they called, dispensaries do we have in the city of Santa Rosa? So we, okay, so we have 24 dispensaries that are operating. We have received 45 permits total since 2017. One is closed, three withdrew the application, and three are expired. So 24 are now operating, and we might have three or four more open and start operating again. Okay, and then just so I'm clear on the type two grant that you're asking us to maybe give direction on tonight, that would not require um, any matching funds if it was under $500,000, but anything over $500,000, the city would be committing to matching those funds. Correct. And we'd only be able to recover 10% for the work from staff that's going to go into this potential program. Correct. That's correct. Thank you. Councilmember Okrepke. Thank you very much, Mayor. Um, a couple questions. Um, kind of dovetailing off the vice mayor's questions. So she asked about dispensaries. How many total cannabis business permits do we have? Micro businesses, um, distribution, processing, all of that. So we have 13 cultivators, 24 cannabis dispensaries operating, 19 manufacturing operating currently, 31 distribution, and one lab testing. Okay, thank you very so much. So total 88 registered cannabis operators. Great, thank you. Um, do we have any equity programs for any other industry? Not that I'm aware of. Look, I'm not aware of any. Okay. And then um, and regarding the arrests, um, when looking at cannabis arrests, are we looking at all of the charges brought during that arrest or if they were just arrested for cannabis? So to my point, would it be, could they have been you know, arrested for um, firing a gun at, uh, in city limits, but also had cannabis on them, and so they were charged with cannabis as well, or is it strictly just cannabis and nothing else? Uh, so my understanding was it was cannabis related, so cannabis was the primary offense. Okay, thank you very much. Are there any additional comments from council members? All right, seeing none, Madam City Clerk, may you please facilitate public comment? Thank you. We are now taking public comment on item 14.1. Please make your way, way to the podium if you'd like to make a comment. You will have three minutes and a countdown timer will alert at the end of that period. As you approach the podium, please provide your name for public record if you choose to do so. Please go ahead. Can you hear me? Yes. Great. Thank you. Uh, Thomas Ells, and, and it may seem a non sequitur, but I'm actually an anthropologist and civil and environmental engineer, so do forgive me, and I want to point out that uh, the low-income regions in Santa Rosa are overburdened uh, because the high-income areas resisted the dispensaries if we go back to the time when those were allocated, if you will, the, the very complicated process and over uh, application and then people were stuck out and really complicated situation. Um, San Francisco did a study on their uh, enforcement of various laws, and they found that they were about 20 times more uh, overburdening their um, young children, particularly young women of color in San Francisco, 20 times more than St. Charles uh, County, in, uh, which was Ferguson, Missouri. Uh, so the, the um, U.S. Uh, Justice Department went and found that Ferguson and St. Charles were, were out of compliance because of their vastly over-arrested um, uh, people of color. And San Francisco, San Francisco did a study found they were 20 times more likely to arrest a young black woman 
in San Francisco than in St. Charles County, than they would have done. And they were already determined to, to have been. Uh, so there's a great deal of this that, that could be addressed. But I would point out maybe, maybe uh, cannabis is not the right industry. What I would say is that many people, for instance, if they were to do anything, uh, very difficult to, to, to get an application for, for doing any of these because of the over, overabundance of them in low-income areas and, and difficulty in, in signing these. The most critical thing is real estate. For them to have an understanding in real estate and they can transcend with that. So there's a great school that's called the Lumlo School of Real Estate and they offer an online course. I have nothing to do with it. I've taken the course. It's a fantastic course. It's like $50. You could offer that to the people that were affected, and it would change their life. I guarantee you it would change their life. They would come away if they took it, if they sat and went through it. It would change their life and their understanding of real estate and everything that you do here. And so do forgive me for pointing it out that, that there really was an impact to people of color. But it's up to you as to how to redress that. And I'm, I'm not sure that's trying, how many, how many dispensaries would you add? How many people would you help? But I guarantee you, if you taught people, if you gave them $50 or $100, and the other thing is, of the, f the first $500,000 is free, and, and the next, say, 500000 you have to put 250000 and you can get 40% of what you're, of that second 50, because it's 10 and 10, it's 20, but it's half, right? So you got the other 500000 free, right? So, thank you. Next speaker. Good evening. Uh, Moses Flickinger here speaking. I uh, just wanted to say it is important that we establish a program here in Sonoma County because the majority of black and brown folks live here within this area of Santa Rosa in the city limits. So, um, and also, I appreciate the report and just wanted to say it might be imperative to also expedite this whole thing for the operators and the few uh, people of color that are operating in this town, you know what I mean? We've, uh, we've waited and watched the county develop their own program and have still been waiting through that, so it might be important to make this, you know what I mean, quick for all of us. Thank you so much. Thank you. Mayor, I see no one else approaching the podium for public comment on this item. Thank you. Are there any additional questions or comments from council members? Okay, seeing none, I just had... Go for it. Just a quick one from me. Um, Normally, I would, I would jump at the chance to support a, a well-intentioned program that wants to look at things through an equity lens and wants to go after state grant funds and wants to support entrepreneurship in the community. Those are, those are things I love to support. In this case, this seems like, a, like an inefficient or kind of muddled policy way to go about it, and I think that came out with some of our questions up here. So I don't feel an immediate, I don't feel the, the urge to support that I normally would. Um, I, I guess I wanted to, to just frame my frame my vote in that context. Thank you. Okay. Are there any other comments? Chris, I'm busting out the seams. I just have to say what I want to say. Give me two seconds. First, I want to say that this is not the same as the tobacco. This is does not mean that we are going to put uh, dispensaries on every corner. Um, if you go back to the presentation, there were other uh, items within the presentation that outline expunging someone's record and helping them to do other things. So this is about equity. It's not about uh, putting dispensaries on every corner. Start there. Uh, the second thing is this honestly reminds me of another program that we have, which is tattoo removal, right? It's about helping people to get where they need to where they need to be and I think that Santa Rosa has done a good job at doing that so I'm a little surprised at some of the comments um, that I'm hearing tonight especially asking if any of the arrests were because of something else or could we um, could we look at that to me that implies something um, 
that I don't want to touch on, I just want to say it makes some implications to even ask that question as far as I'm concerned when you look at the demographics of the people that are affected by this and the demographics of the people that we're, we're talking about. And I'll breathe and with that, Councilmember Rogers. Uh, thank you, Mayor. Um, uh, if Councilmember Krepke, because I'm also making the motion, I believe, right? Mm -hmm. You want to have Councilmember Krepke give his comments first? Councilmember Krepke. Just to your point, Mayor, I think you're misinterpreting my question. My question was to clarify if it was just for cannabis or cannabis and something else. We have a clear idea of what the data is. It was not an, uh, implying anything or trying to say anything. I, it's just, were they arrested for something else or not? Yes or no? It's to get a clear idea and the consultant answered my question. Um, I tend to agree with uh, Council Member Stapp on this. Um, and looking at the barriers to entry, I mean, I've, I've seen more cannabis applications than anybody on this, having done four years on Planning Commission right after the legalization of cannabis. Um, and I've seen so many come through and so many just not get done. Um, you know, they get approved and then they just never get built, they never get opened, nothing happens. Financial and technical, that's, that's, those are barriers for everybody. Um, criminal, that's something that, you know, we don't, we, we can discuss whether or not we want to help with expungement or not. Um, but when it comes to the other things, distrust of government and social stigma, we can't address that at all. That's something we can't change. I've seen people up here yell, you know, don't you dare open another pot dealership. I mean, it's just the way people think about certain things. And then um, caps on licenses and zoning, that's the ordinance itself. In order to address those, we'd have to completely reopen the ordinance. I don't know if any of us would be willing to do that or not. So, um, you know, the barriers are great, but I, I tend to agree with council member staff, especially since we don't have an equity um, program for any other kind of business, whether it be restaurants or construction or anything. I mean, we could talk about helping people get open up their own construction business and getting involved in the trades and, 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 and uh, trainings and stuff like that, but I just tend to, not have the the as councilmember uh, Stapp put it the the drive to do something like this because it's it's it, it's very it's very convoluted and and I and I am definitely not in favor of um, of anything having to do with matching funds um, coming out of our budget considering where we are budget wise. Councilmember Stapp. Oh, just to, to follow up on my earlier comments as well, Mayor, given your, your thoughtful, thoughtful rejoinder, um, I'm, I am very much in support of having this kind of entrepreneurship support with an equity lens. Um, to some extent, we, we're, we're building this in the community now is with the Small Business Development Center. I would love to expand that. My, my issues with this program are the, the single industry focus, first of all, and then the fact that it seems, it seems like it's going to be taxing on both city staff and city budget for uncertain effects. So I'd love, I would very, I would love to revisit items like this that are broad, broader based, but with the same focus. I'm just not sure that this is the right item, and that's or that, that that's how I'm seeing it tonight. Councilmember Fleming. Yeah, I, I appreciate some of the concerns about this. However, I think that there are the the argument that we only do this for cannabis um, is not exactly um, fully accurate. We have a project labor agreement in place in large part because um, the unionized trade groups hire women and hire people of color and train people who are uh, have, have criminal records and help people to move on with their lives, which is a really large part of what the city does. So that's one example. Um, I think the argument that because we don't do it in one industry doesn't mean that we, sh that, that therefore we shouldn't do it in others, then limits us from ever starting anywhere. Um, and then <clears throat> just with, with great respect, you know, folks from lower income backgrounds definitely don't have the same financial or technical training that people with, who come from families of higher um, incomes or with greater levels of education have. And so to say that, um, that we can't fix that, this is, this is an opportunity to help and, for, and potentially to rebuild some trust that people have lost in our governments you know, you see 500 times more likely to be arrested for cannabis in the city of Santa Rosa if you're African American. That's really stunning. So I, I think that we need to maybe take a moment and and reflect on how we can be part of a solution here rather than, you know, picking at something when we wouldn't do it if it was something that was 
maybe more more aligned with interests of, of everybody or with certain parts of our community. I think that, that this report has been given perhaps um, a higher level of scrutiny than, than other causes for, for our city. So with respect, I, I hope that we can pass this and move forward for our community and, and repair some of the damage that has been done um, in, the, in the war on drugs. Are there any other? Vice Mayor. I just want to go back to the staff capacity because I think that that's some of our hesitation that we're seeing because of the amount of staff time that potentially could be needed to implement a program like this. It's good that we had this study done and give us the information, but my, my concern is around that. Could you talk a little bit more about how many hours of staff time would be needed for implementation with the 10% that we're able to um, retain from this grant, be able to cover that staff time, and then do we have the current staff for this if we were able to do it, or, or is it like we're taking our current staff and we're stretching them thinner to implement a program that's in place? That's my concern right now. And then I do want Alan to address the ROI on that, just so I'm clear that we don't get any additional money for cannabis, it's just the same as any other business in the city of Santa Rosa. Thank you. Good evening. Good evening, Mayor, Vice Mayor, and members of the council. Gabe Osborne, Acting Director of Planning and Economic Development. I'll actually touch on a few questions that the council brought forward. Um, I think it's important to understand the process we're looking at here. So this is essentially adopting the assessment. And then our next step is to analyze what the program would look like. So as we go down that road of looking at the program, obviously there's eligibility criteria. There's understanding how many members of the community will benefit from this program. And then we're controlling that eligibility criteria. Um, there can also be additional analysis that's performed to determine the return on investment. There can be an additional analysis performed to determine what sort of benefit this has purely from an economic development standpoint and from a neighborhood revitalization standpoint. That's what we would be working through in 2024, in the summer of 2024. Um, so the level of staff time that that takes, that would be a planning driven exercise to start framing that up, but it will tie into other departments um, because really the understanding we have to come to at that point is where does it live, what are the staffing timelines associated with the development, but then also the long-term nature of this program, and really how many full-time employees are needed to run this. Um, and part of that analysis will look at best industry standards, what other jurisdictions have done on this front to understand what that looks like. Um, but a lot of that is unknown at this point, because that will be the exercise that we would go through if the council so chooses to provide direction for us to prepare that um, program manual. Um, now when we bring that program forward, we will bring that program forward with all those additional details so the council can make a decision on whether adoption makes sense or not for the community. Um, and we'll provide the appropriate staffing levels for what we think that program should look like long term. Um, but to answer your immediate question, Vice Mayor, um, I believe, and I'll I lean on Jessica a little bit for the response to this, um, but overall where we are right now from a policy development standpoint um, is, is the department has a set of priorities. Priorities. Um, this will fit into those priorities because we've defined a timeline to it. Um, my guess will it absorb a significant amount of time from a senior planner uh, to work out that policy and then it will also touch into other departments. Um, so usually with policies of this nature, I generally say 25% of one person to get it going. And then as it moves into other departments, it's a bit unknown. We have to go through that exercise. Um, but it will take staff time simply to stand up and develop the program manual to bring that forward in front of the council. And then, as I mentioned, the long term is a bit unknown at this point, but we'll bring all that information to council as we come through with adoption. And Director Osborne, can you clarify, there will be other rounds of funding we can apply for. It doesn't mean we necessarily have to apply for this, but we also were mandated to um, reply, supply a report based off of the funding, based off the grant that we applied for. So we needed, we had requirements to respond to this uh, for the grant too as well. That is correct, city manager. So the, the item you're seeing today is in response to the grant. Um, so that's presenting the assessment. Um, as we move forward and we start 
identifying what a program would look like, we can also identify what other funding sources would look like for that program. Um, what was discussed today can be a bit challenging. Anytime we have a grant that only provides 10% of the administration costs, um, then obviously general fund dollars are the next in line for the support to that under most circumstances. But as we go through that exercise, we can also look at other funding sources that may be able to support that program long term. And then if you were to take somebody, if we were to implement this program now, was this something that you had planned from the beginning of the year that we were going to start to take staff time away or would there be other programs or things that would have to be delayed because of this action? That is an excellent question. When we initially started the process of doing the assessment, it was well known what the next steps to that would be. Um, when we look at where we currently stand um, with other initiatives that the city's working on, uh, taking, and I will once again lead to Jessica because she runs that team, um, it was thought through for as long as I've been in my current capacity with the department that we would potentially be looking at this next step in the program. Um, so it, it's not something that it was not envisioned from a priority setting standpoint, um, but Jessica can provide a little more of an impact, a little more of an explanation, excuse me, on the impacts to the planning team. Yes, um, and one thing I want to note is when um, we initiated this type one grant that we're here before you right now with um, the assessment on, um, at that time, my understanding was that there was um, a somewhat of an assumption that we could partner with the county um, and their program and utilize their staffing and their program to then manage this type two. Um, and the only way to proceed with that was to do this assessment first. Um, so we were successful in getting this assessment and, and we're proceeding with that idea that we would then be partnering with the county, which would have very, or limited impacts to staff resources for the type two. Um, however, uh, as we were getting closer towards the end of this assessment period, uh, we, part, we met with the county, sat down with them to talk about their program, understand it and how we could fit into it. And it was, uh, it was uh, brought to our attention that the county would not be able to include us in their program, that we would have to go on our own. That's not to say that we couldn't, you know, uh, in the this, this is the first year of the county's program right now. Now. they're in it right now so you know we could you know t continue that conversation with them to see if there's any possibility in the future um, but as of right now the county does not have the capacity um, or the ability to administer the city's program um, but you know from a capacity standpoint yes I and mean, we are at full capacity with working on the policies that we're currently working on um, and as as Gabe mentioned um, you know I think it very likely would take about a quarter of a planner to move forward this next piece um, we can figure out a way to make that that work um, but we do have a lot going on with policy work in our department right now can you clarify the county has two full-time staff uh, to handle this program, correct? Is it two? I believe that's correct. Yeah. So, I'm sorry, so the county has two full-time employees that develop, that do their program and they, they're able to pay that out of a 10% retention from their grant? So I don't have all the specifics, but no, I, I do know that they are not able to pay for it with just the 10%. Um, they have allocated funding to move that forward. Yeah, I just wanted to clarify because staff is saying a um, quarter of a person, a half of a person, but the county itself has two full-time staff members dedicated to this. Yeah, and, and also to clarify that the quarter of a person that we're talking about would be just to move forward with drafting the, the draft program that we would bring forward to council. That does not um, uh, include whatever staff time is needed to execute the program, you know, once we move forward with that uh, grant application, should we do it at this point, as Gabe mentioned and I mentioned earlier, we don't know what that impact will be because we don't yet know what the program looks like and how many businesses and individuals would um, you know, benefit from that program. And I would add to that, if I may, uh, just generally a program of this nature, obviously the volume is unknown. It really requires a dedication of at least one full-time employee to be successful. Um, there are often starts and stops in the application process, but the general support at least requires that, and then you're building off of that. Thank you, that's helpful. 
So Vice Mayor, uh, relative to the cannabis industry tax, um, the city and, and I apologize, I don't have the exact rates where they are right now. Um, I, uh, my understanding is, is that our rates are actually quite low. Um, uh, uh, so the taxes, uh, I would imagine that the tax barrier is more on the state end than it is on the, the city's end. I know ours, uh, especially for dispensaries, could go up to 8%, and we are not near that right now. I think ours is, is held pretty low, and we did that intentionally as a as the program began, or began, uh, we have the ability to raise it, or the council has the ability to raise it, and we have not brought that to you uh, at this time. Um, from a revenue standpoint, this is general fund operating revenue that comes in. Uh, it's, it runs anywhere from 1.8 to about $2 million. I think it, it may have even come in at 2.1. Uh, for the last year, um, but that's about where we are. We feel that we, uh, uh, we're, we're plateauing at that $1.8 to $2 million range. Um, I, I believe I have the rates in front of me. You may want to clarify this. For a cultivator, it's 2% or $5 per square feet. Uh, for a manufacturer, it's 1%, and for adult dispensary, it's 3%. And I believe um, CFO stated 8% is the max, or $25 a square foot. And I do believe medicinal is 0%. That is correct. And so is distributor, it's zero as well. Are there any additional questions? Seeing none, Councilmember Rogers. I appreciate that. I'm going to play a resident historian for a minute. Uh, back in 2016, the city decided that it wanted to be at the forefront and treat cannabis like any other industry. You see in that tax rate how we tried to craft it to attract specific jobs based on the expected wages. That's why manufacturing was held low, so that manufacturing would be located here. Uh, there's also a de facto agreement with the county about we would be the proper place to site dispensaries while they would be the proper site for cultivation where they had more room. So it was all sort of built together. In our haste to throw together a program and really capture an emerging market, one of the things that we did miss was this conversation around equity. And once we had our programs that were in place, we started to hear this conversation from other jurisdictions about particularly the BIPOC community, how it had uh, for decades uh, felt the brunt of cannabis policies uh, and uh, over policing around cannabis and that what people were concerned about was that if we didn't advance an equity program, what could happen was you'd have rich white folks who would move in and make money off of an industry that had historically uh, harmed BIPOC communities. So we made an agreement at that time that we would come back and look at the equity programs. We're behind other jurisdictions. Uh, but that's why I'm, I'm perfectly, I get all of the concerns around staffing. I hope that the quarter staff person, the quarter that we're getting is their head, that would be the most helpful, I think. Like, I get the concerns, and yet that was part of our promise that we made to the community when we embarked on this. So I'm happy to move the resolution uh, of the Council of the City of Santa Rosa accepting the City of Santa Rosa Cannabis Equity Assessment and directing staff to prepare a cannabis equity program. Wait for the reading of the text. And that's because it's a promise that we made when we had this as an emerging market that we understandably sprinted in the beginning and then had to take stock of what were other places doing that was more equitable or better than what we were doing. Second, and, and if, if the mayor pleases, I'd like to offer a small anecdote about the early days of permitting these um, dispensaries. You know, we had, I'll never forget one of the most difficult discussions we have. When I first came on council, I thought all we did on the city council was make determinations about cannabis density. 
Um, it seemed that every every day during my first six months, we were picking between two two competing applicants, and one of them I'll never forget was um, uh, was a Caucasian, a white guy who came forward, had no criminal background, and um, and they and a, and a person of color. I think he was Latino, and you know we denied his application. Um, it was totally subjective, but one of the reasons that I heard from council members, um, you know, in deliberations was that the person did have uh, a criminal background. And so, you know, it's, it's really clear to me that we have historically made these decisions, whether conscious or unconscious, about who gets to participate in the legal and regulated market um, based on, on factors that disproportionately impact people of color. So it, it's my hope that we see our way toward um, not getting stuck and mired in the details today, but that we think broadly and with leadership and leave the details of the implementation and execution of this to our, our capable staff. So with that, I hope you consider my comments when you vote. We have a motion made by Council Member Rogers and a second by Council Member Fleming. Madam City Clerk, may you please call the vote. Thank you, Council Member Stapp. I was very close to being persuaded by my two colleagues to my right. Um, thank you for that history, and you did make me think about it. Ultimately, I think the, the staff, the near-term staff burden, as well as the muddled policy wins out in my head, but not without some second thoughts. So thank you again. Um, on this one, I'm gonna vote no. Councilmember Rogers? Aye. Councilmember Okrepke? No. Councilmember Fleming? Aye. Councilmember Alvarez is abstaining. Council or Vice Mayor McDonald? No. Mayor Rogers? Yes. Let the record show this motion fails uh, with a split vote three yes, three no, and one abstention. Thank you. We will now go back up to our public comment on non agenda matters um, 13. Madam City Clerk. Thank you, we are now taking public comments on item 13, non-agenda matters. This is a time when any person may address the council on matters not listed on the agenda, but which are within the subject matter jurisdiction of the council. If you are in the chamber and would like to comment, but have not provided a speaker card or your name, please make your way to the podium. You will have three minutes and a countdown timer will alert at the end of that period. Mr. Ells, go ahead. Um, previously, I was addressing the statistics, so that item was on capital improvements were statistics, and I hope you will allow me to address not statistical elements uh, with respect to Hearn Avenue and the capital uh, improvements, but not statistical elements. Thank you. So I'm having trouble with the overhead here. Thank you, I'll turn it on. I didn't hear you say you needed the overhead. Oh, I thought it was on. Okay, thank you. So over here is the proposal to provide overcrossings for Hearn, which would build two lanes, remove two lanes, and, and replace these two lanes. So you would add two lanes at a current cost of four lanes, over twice the normal cost to make improvement of this type. That happens a lot in urban areas. If you're gonna build Embarcadero Freeway through San Francisco, it's gonna cost you a lot if you build the, the 91 freeway or uh, in, in Los Angeles in, from the LAX, if you're gonna build that and you have to go through community after community, you have to elevate the entire thing, it's gonna be very expensive. That's what happens. You have infrastructure in place. Here you have no other infrastructure in place except for this ramps. The ramps as proposed here 
using the diverging diamond would be free flowing no signals here a possible roundabout here so no signals here you could have you can envision how Hearn, existing Hearn, would actually flow. It could be reversing. So you could have two lanes in the morning and two lanes in the evening coming back. You ha this is a tremendous problem for people and their families to move at those times in the morning to get to work, to get to school, and in the evening to get home. As I showed you before, without going into the statistics, it's overwhelming that this area is isolated. And to spend twice as much to improve it, or essentially getting half of what you're spending, when you could go ahead and actually put all of that to benefit, and instead of having just four lanes, you would get four new lanes, and you would have six lanes. So you would have an additional crossing for this area. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mayor. I see, oh, please approach the podium for your public comment, sir. Wait, you see if there any for yours. Would, do you need the overhead as well? Uh, this is good, thank you. I'm Peter Allen, president of the, of the Wild Oak Homeowners Association. And in my last visit to the city council, I expressed appreciation to the city for finally recognizing that an easement in our association was private, not public, and that it was owned by our association. So thank you. The city building office then issued a notice of violation of city codes to the homeowner at 805 White Oak Drive for two reasons. Their utility meters were illegally placed on our easement, and the post for the electrical meter was also illegally placed on private property owned by our association. This notice required a plan to remove these two code violations by November 20th. We didn't hear anything on this by November 21st, so I asked the city building department, what happened? I was told that the notice of violation was paused by request of the attorney for this homeowner. There is a separate civil action on this against this homeowner for a violation of our homeowner's rules, not the city's rules. But the city's not a plaintiff nor a defendant in this civil action, and again, it is not about civil code. So I will be blunt. The evidence by this action is that it would suggest that the city is unfairly colluding with this homeowner to deny us the use of our property. For example, I'm asking if any of you had a neighbor who put a post or their utility meters on your property, would you accept the city's refusal to enforce the law and have them removed? No. I think every one of you would be as upset as I am. This meter, these meters are also in shallow and unstable soil at the top of a road cut. Should, they, the, should the soil slip and break both the gas and utility li, gas and electrical lines, the risk of fire is very large, and the city's liability for its failure to correct this unsafe condition is potentially huge. In summary, justice must be blind, but it is not in this case. It took us a year, a year, to convince the city that it was unfairly favoring the homeowner by claiming the easement was owned by the city, not us. The city finally recognized it as unfair by recognizing we owned it, not the city. But now, it is once again acting unfairly. The city can correct this appearance of unfairness by now requiring that the city codes be enforced and restarting the enforcement action that it has, has issued. It will also protect the safety of the citizens in our part of Santa Rosa. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor MC. No one else approached the podium for public comment on non-agenda matters. Thank you. We will now proceed with item 14.2. Madam City Manager. Item 14.2 is a report, Home Investment Partnership, American Rescue Plan, Home ARP, Funding Awards.
Good afternoon, Mayor Rogers, Vice Mayor McDonald, and members of the council. I am Sasha Brown, Program Specialist for Housing and Community Services, and here with me today is Kelly Kuykendall, Housing and Community Services Manager. The item in front of you today seeks approval of two funding awards using Home ARP funds. This slide provides an overview of the presentation. I'll provide some background on the Home ARP program and allocation plan, then get into the request for proposals, summary of those proposals, and then finish up with our recommendation. The Home ARP program was created by the American Rescue Plan Act of 2021, which appropriated $5 billion to provide housing, services, and shelter to qualifying populations, which I'll define further on the next slide. The city was allocated $2,737,433 in Home ARP funds by the U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development, known as HUD. Through HUD's required consultation and public participation process, the city developed a Home ARP allocation plan, which identified the use of Home ARP funds for supportive services, specifically focusing on homelessness prevention. On February 28th of 2023, Council authorized submittal of the plan to HUD. As stated on the previous slide, Home ARP funds must be used to benefit qualifying populations. These qualifying populations are individuals and families who are homeless, at risk of homelessness, fleeing or attempting to flee domestic violence, including dating violence, sexual assault, stalking, or human trafficking, other populations at risk of homelessness due to housing instability, and veterans and families that include a veteran that meet one of the preceding criteria. Of the total Home ARP award, 15% is allocated for city administration, 80% is for program delivery, and 5% is for nonprofit operating costs. This provided a total of $2,326,819 available for supportive services in our RFP. We released our RFP on August 31st of 2023 with proposals due on October 2nd of 2023. We were seeking qualified and experienced organizations to provide supportive services starting January 1st of 2024. We received two proposals, one from Committee on the Shelter List, known as COTS, and the other from Catholic Charities. The evaluation criteria for these proposals was on a scale of 100 points with five bonus points available for including homeless prevention services. The criteria included proven delivery of supportive services, the ability to serve all qualifying populations, organizational capacity, financial reasonability of the proposal, the proven delivery of accurate data in compliance with various reporting requirements, experience and alignment with best practices, alignment with the Homelessness Solutions Strategic Plan, having policies and procedures for engaging clients and seeking feedback, and the overall completeness and quality of the proposal. This criteria was used to score the two proposals received, which I'll summarize next. One of the Home Art proposals was from COTS. COTS is based in Petaluma and has more than 35 years of experience providing services and housing to vulnerable populations in Sonoma County, including homelessness prevention and supportive services. In Petaluma, COTS operates the Mary Isaac Center Shelter, Kids First Family Shelter, Recuperative Care, and People's Village Tiny Homes. Additionally, COTS is expanding their permanent supportive housing services to Santa Rosa. They're utilizing Measure O funding from the Sonoma County Continuum of Care, COC, now known as the Sonoma County Homeless Coalition. This is adding additional units of scattered site permanent supportive housing in Santa Rosa. COTS proposes to open a satellite office in Santa Rosa and provide financial assistance to 50 participants targeted at assisting individuals to retain their current housing or exit homelessness. Participants will also have access to urgent assistance, providing for urgent needs such as toiletries and blankets, case management, food, transportation, and mental health services. Mental health services will be provided by a contracted licensed marriage and family therapist. COTS plans to reduce the length of time participants spend homeless, increase the retention of permanent housing, and limit returns to homelessness. The other home art proposal was from Catholic Charities. Catholic Charities has more than 40 years of experience serving vulnerable populations in Sonoma County, also including homelessness prevention and supportive services. They currently operate Samuel L. Jones Hall Homeless Shelter, Caritas Family Center, 
the Safe Parking Program, Caritas Drop-In Center, and the Homeless Outreach Services Team host. These programs all receive city funding. Catholic Charities proposes to provide financial assistance to 90 participants targeted at assisting individuals to retain their current housing or exit homelessness. Participants will also have access to housing counseling, food and mental health services. These mental health services will be contracted by Santa Rosa Community Health and available at the Caritas Center Clinic. Catholic Charities plans to assist participants by building financial resiliency and housing stability, to bolster personal resiliency and coping skills to stabilize housing outcomes, and seeks to reduce food insecurity, recurrence of homelessness, and the impacts of homelessness. On October 10th of 2023, an evaluation committee reviewed and scored the two proposals. The evaluation committee was comprised of four staff members, including representatives from the Housing Community Services and the Finance Department. Based on the evaluation criteria and subsequent scoring, COTS received an average score of 99 points and Catholic Charities received an average score of 97.25 points. The total funding available in this RFP was $2,326,819. So we are recommending funding COTS for the full amount of their request, and we recommend funding Catholic Charities for the remaining amount. This is a 10% reduction from Catholic Charities' original request. However, Catholic Charities has already adjusted their proposed scope of services accordingly, and this was the proposal presented in the previous slides. It is recommended by the Housing and Community Services Department that the Council, by resolution, approve a grant agreement for the Home Art Program with Committee on the Shelter List COTS in the amount of $711,375 for an 18-month period, January 1st, 2024, to June 30th, 2025. Approve a grant agreement for the Home Art Program with Catholic Charities of the Diocese of Santa Rosa in the amount of $1,615,444 for an 18-month period, January 1st, 2024 to June 30th, 2025, and authorize the Director of Housing Community Services to execute the grant agreements for home art program funds with COTS and Catholic Charities in the total amount of $2,326,819. Thank you. Thank you for that presentation. Looking to Council to see if there are any questions. Councilmember Rogers. Not a question per se, but I think this is the first time we've seen Sasha since she got married. So I just want to say congratulations. <laughs> All right. Are there any questions, any other questions from council members? Seeing no questions, Madam City Clerk. Oh, Vice Mayor. I just had a quick question. I'm perfectly happy supporting these two groups and following the recommendation tonight, but do we ever appropriate money to SA Wide um, Dream Center or TLC since that really meets the criteria of those at-risk youth that are in the community? I just saw this was a pretty large grant and I wasn't sure if funds were available for that. So we did put out a request for proposals in RFP and um, say did not respond to that RFP. Also as part of the home art requirements, they do have to serve all qualifying populations so they wouldn't be able to just serve age-based populations. Thank you, that's helpful. Are there any other questions from council members? Seeing none, Madam City Clerk, may you please facilitate public comment. Thank you, Mayor. We are now taking public comment on item 14.2. Please make your way to the podium if you'd like to provide public comment. You'll have three minutes and a countdown timer will alert at the end of that period. As you approach the podium, please provide your name for public record if you choose to do so. All right, speaker, go ahead. Okay, can you all hear me? Yes. Um, so my name is Jenny Lynn Holmes. I'm the CEO of Catholic Charities in Santa Rosa. And I first wanna say thank you so very much for this very incredible opportunity uh, for the Home Art Funds. 
Um, every single day we see people walking through our front doors looking for housing assistance, food assistance, and all types of other services. And we currently have 200 people on our waiting list just to receive financial assistance, just to stay in their homes. And so the funds that this will provide will allow us to serve those individuals, keep them housed, and for those that become homeless, hopefully get them rehoused so that homelessness is very brief um, in their experience of it. We've been working really hard to get upstream of, of homelessness and preventing that homelessness in this case is a critical source of funding that has been very rare for us to be able to find. So we're very grateful for this opportunity to be able to do that. Additionally, I just wanna mention this will also support our food distributions. Uh, we currently are uh, unable to meet the need of individuals coming to our food distributions because we literally run out of food. So this is an opportunity to enhance our food distributions in the city of Santa Rosa. Um, and the part that we're probably most excited about is the additional support for mental health care. And we will be subcontracting that to Santa Rosa Community Health Center, which will also enhance the care for mental health uh, services among the individuals that we are serving in this um, qualifying populations, but also help to subcontract to other providers that allow us uh, to serve our in individuals in an even more um, a holistic way. And I just want to also say one quick thing to Vice Mayor McDonald's question around SAWA. I will just mention we do subcontract uh, some of the funds that we receive from the city of Santa Rosa to SAY for um, targeted uh, support of the transitional aged youth pro uh, individuals. So some of the funds does flow through Catholic Charities, but we do take the approach of subcontracting to have diverse approaches to the individuals that are coming through uh, our front doors for need um, and to bolster other nonprofits um, as well. So with that, I thank you again for this opportunity and available to answer any additional questions later. Thank you. Good evening, council members. My name is Sanford Robinson and I'm the director of grants with uh, COTS, Committee on the Shelterless. And I just wanted to also express uh, our gratitude for considering us for this opportunity to officially uh, partner with the city of Santa Rosa and provide the much needed services for homelessness prevention. Um, and that's really all I have. Hello, yes, uh, Thomas Ells, and uh, do forgive me. Uh, in the question regarding SAY, they've been here for a while. The, the founder of the organization that I run uh, was Alan Strawn. He was the founder of SAY. And um, currently, as I understand, they have just eliminated their executive offices and uh, branch, if you will, and joined with a Sebastopol organization, so they're in a bit of flux and probably were not able to actually complete the applications. And that's what I'm really here to address is that if you noticed it showed 15% for administration of this grant for the city and 5% for administration of the grant by the nonprofit. So one third of the ratio and funds. So, so if, if, if you look at that, it was uh, um, 2.5 approximate million dollars and 15% or 400,000 would be allocated to the city and 5%. Uh, so for COTS, that's gonna be $35,000. And for, for Catholic Charities, uh, the five percent is going to be eighty thousand dollars to run that one point six million dollar program administratively, and now you got to think of all the accounting and all the different the things that you want to have and responses, and responsibilities, and so on. It's very hard. Five percent. So when I was at the task force for the homeless, we we uh, Georgia. Uh, issued grants, federal grants that were called emergency food and service grants, ESFG, and I became their accountant and I did uh, the checking of those, if you will, and all of the 
you know, the, each each ex each expenditure for those entities is a, is a food expenditure. So if somebody gets food, it's five dollars. So almost every maybe the average, maybe it's two dollars, two fifty, maybe something else is seven dollars, and the the average is maybe five. It's less than ten dollars. So if you think of one point six million, that's one hundred and sixty thousand accounting entries. 160,000 accounting entries, and they only get 5%. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor. I see no one else wishing to provide public comment in the chamber. Thank you. Council Member Fleming? Thank you, Mayor. I'd like to bring a resolution of the Council of the City of Santa Rosa approving two grant agreements for the Home Investment Partnership. American Rescue Plan, Home ARP program with Committee on the Shelterless and Catholic Charities of the Diocese of Santa Rosa in the respective amounts of seven hundred thousand eleven seven seven hundred eleven thousand dollars and three hundred seventy five sorry and uh, one point six one five million and four hundred forty four dollars for an eighteen month period. Um, January 1, 2024 to June 30, 2025, and waive further reading of the text. Second. We have a motion made by Council Member Fleming and a, a second by Vice Mayor McDonald. Are there any additional comments from Council Members? And yes, congratulations on your nuptials. <laughs> All right, with that. Madam City Clerk, can you please call the vote? Thank you, Council Member Stapp. Aye. Council Member Rogers. Aye. Council Member Okrepke. Aye. Council Member Fleming. Aye. Council Member Alvarez. Aye. Vice Mayor McDonald. Aye. Mayor Rogers. Aye. Let the record show that passes unanimously. Thank you. I appreciate the repeated attempts to uh, embarrass Sasha. I'm sure she loved it. Thank you very much for the presentation. Um, um, Madam Mayor, if we can, um, we would like to go back to item 14.1. So we'll let um, Councilman excuse himself. All right. We will be going back to 14.1. So, Council Member Rogers, this is your motion, so listen up. Uh, and we will have our Madam City Attorney walk us through this process. Yes, thank you. Thank you for going back, Madam Mayor. Um, I'm understanding from staff that we really do need to ask that the Council accept the report that you heard on this item uh, because it was. Um, we used funding, uh, federal funding for this, um, I'm sorry, um, grant funding for this item. And so um, I am making a request and recommendation on behalf of staff that we do a little bit of surgery to your proposed resolution. Um, and at the end, it will be a resolution that simply accepts the report. Um, my proposed uh, surgery to the resolution that is in your packet would be to make the following changes. Um, the first change would be to remove from the title uh, the following text um, and directing staff to prepare a cannabis equity program. The second change would be to remove three of the whereas clauses. Um, they are uh, the last three whereas clauses, um, which are paragraphs five through seven. And then finally, the third change would be on page two of the um, proposed resolution in your materials, we would be removing the paragraph at the top of page two that begins, be it further resolved that city staff shall prepare, et cetera. That entire paragraph should also come out. With those changes, you end up with a resolution that simply um, acknowledges and accepts the report. I'll make a motion with the proposed changes. Second. We have a motion made by Council Member Rogers, seconded by the mayor. Madam City Clerk, may we please call the vote? 
Does it have to be the initial person that seconded? You already took public comment on this item. It would be the mayor's call whether you take public comment again on this additional um, action. Being as though we already took um, public comment on this item, I don't believe we need to. Um, we're just, for technicality purposes, accepting the report. You, yes. You've satisfied the requirements under both the Brown Act and your local rules. Yes, so I think we can proceed. Thank you. Thank you, Council Member Stapp. Aye. Council Member Rogers. Aye. Council Member Okrepke. Aye. Council Member Fleming. Aye. Council Member Alvarez has abstained. Vice Mayor McDonald. Aye. Mayor Rogers. Aye. Let the record show this passes with six affirmative votes as amended. Thank you Thank once you. again. No problem. Thank you for uh, bringing it to our attention. Um, we have no public hearings um, tonight, so we will go back to item, no we won't. We will take our second public comments on non-agenda matters. Thank you, we are now taking public comment on item 17, non-agenda matters. This is the second period where we take public comments. If you did not provide public comment on item 13, now is your opportunity to provide comment on non-agenda matters. Mayor MC, no one approached the podium for public comments on non-agenda matters. Thank you. Sorry, this is a bit confusing. We kind of hopped hopped all over on this agenda. Um, we'll now go to item 10.2.1, which is our time to elect our next vice mayor. Um, I would like to take the opportunity to thank Vice Mayor McDonald for being a great partner. You have been nothing but supportive during my first year as mayor. Your ability to put the city's interest first, no matter what, is admirable. And again, thank you for your dedication and your willingness to be a great partner. You are very much appreciated. Thank you. And with that, I would like to give the vice mayor an opportunity to say a few words if she desires. I just want to say thank you so much to our mayor as well as the council for the honor of being elected as your vice mayor this last year. Um, I really love being in the thick of everything, going through the agendas and seeing what's up next for us to be um, considering as a council. So um, it's, it is, it's such an honor for me to serve in this role, no matter if it's a council member or your vice mayor. And, and I just really want um, the staff to know how much I appreciate all the work they do. Um, when you're vice mayor to a great mayor, you get to see like what's been happening behind the scenes and they make it seem so seamless and it's really the dedication of our, our, our incredible staff that make everything really happen. But it's been a great year and I appreciate working with you and um, I've appreciated working with all this fine council as well as the other two members who left um, after the last election. So thank you again and I look forward to supporting our next vice mayor and you as you continue in this role and thank you for the flowers they're beautiful you're welcome and thank you madam city clerk may we please have public comment on this item thank you mayor we are now taking public comment on item 10.2.1 the election of the vice mayor if you'd like to provide public comment please make your way to the podium you will have three minutes and a countdown timer will alert at the end of that period as you approach the podium please provide your name for public record if you choose to do so i'm seeing no one approach the podiums for public comment mayor thank you so looking to council to see if we have a nomination for vice mayor Councilmember Rogers. I'd like to nominate uh, Councilmember Stapp. Second. We have a nomination from Councilmember Rogers and a second from Councilmember Okrepke. May we see if there are any additional? Councilmember Stapp, do you accept the nomination? 
I do. Thank you. Are there any additional nominations? All right, seeing none, then I guess congratulations, Council Member Sapp, on becoming the next Vice Mayor. Thank you, everyone. All right, um, we have nothing more on our agenda, but I would like to adjourn the meeting in the name of Francis Diaz, who was a longtime planning commissioner for the city of Santa Rosa. She was a trailblazer um, in our city and she will be missed. So with that, meeting adjourned, have a great night.